few minutes, I just want to continue the discussion we were having earlier about, about OT, operational technology. And, and that's an area, I, I think a lot of the things that you've heard today, I, I think, you know, Fortinet is known as a cybersecurity company. We ship the majority of firewalls in the world every year. Um, we're, we're clearly known for that. I think what you're hearing today is that we're also, you know, a stand-up networking company. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, same thing is true for OT, the OT side uh, of the networking company. Uh, so we've been doing OT, we've been doing operational technology products for over 20 years, almost as long as we've been in business. Uh, so that's certainly nothing new to us. And we've got um, kind of parts and parcel of our, of our products, of our services addressing uh, every different area of the OT environment, whether it's securing the environment, managing the environment, connecting the environment. Um, those are all part of uh, what you will see in our in our OT portfolio. Um, not going to go into this in too much detail, but in general, you know, we are as we were saying earlier, we are seeing a very strong convergence uh, between IT and OT operations really merging as as those cost centers, as those departments, and in, in a lot of organizations start to really come together. We're seeing a lot of blurring of the lines uh, between what it means to be an IT professional and to be an IT professional in an OT environment. Uh, so a lot of those same products that we have uh, for zero trust, for security operations, for security services, those all uh, translate really nicely from uh, OT to IT. And in many of those cases, we have OT specific views on those products. I'm not going to go into you know, all of the OT specific things we have in Fortisim and Fortis Sassy and all of those areas. Um, suffice to say, we do have a lot of OT specific hardened hardware designed to go into uh, rugged environments. And that's mostly what we're talking about today. Since this is mobility field day, we're kind of talking about radios, we're talking about mobility. Uh, specifically, we're talking about Wi-Fi, LTE uh, in those environments, but we do have a fairly large portfolio of rugged environments, some of, of devices. Some of those are, are up here. We can take a look at those during the break. Uh, but of course, FortiGates, we have a whole lineup of FortiGate ruggeds uh, in both DIN rail format as well as small desktop or wall mounted uh, types of formats, both with and without LTE. So you've got a, a wide range of those. Uh, the newest one is the, uh, the one we have there on the, uh, on the end there, the FortiGate rugged 70G with dual 5G radios uh, inside. Uh, pretty fantastic little radio, especially, you know, if you put all of the antennas directly on the FortiGate uh, like they tend to like to do here for pictures, which just looks a little bit comical, uh, I think. Um, but you can certainly have dual active 5G radios in the FortiGate uh, simultaneously. Uh, far from that, we have the, uh, the FortiGate Rugged 70F 3G 4G, which is a single 3G 4G radio here. Uh, that's what I'm actually using here. Uh, and then moving down from that, same model without LTE. And then we have the uh, desktop or wall mounted uh, 60Fs uh, as well. Moving over to switches and access points, we have a couple of rugged switches that are currently available, a couple of rugged access points we've been talking about, uh, and then of course, lots of features within that. So um, I think as Chris and, and Sumant were talking about earlier, there is one common operating system, there is one common hardware architecture for the most part, uh, different ASICs at different scales within the portfolio, but it is one 40 OS operating system uh, across the portfolio. So you get the same functions, the same capabilities in these rugged, uh, FortiGates and in these rugged switches and in these rugged access points that you do in the enterprise in the carpeted space versions. Uh, so you can support OT features, you can support OT security services on a non-rugged uh, FortiGate or a non-rugged access point, perfectly fine. So if you've got OT environments that don't require rugged hardened hardware, perfectly fine. Roll this out there, all of the security capabilities are there. And all some of, of those, some of those more esoteric OT protocols like Profinet and all those corner yeah. case wonky things, all, all fully supported. I absolutely, we'll, we'll dig into that. Um, let me keep going. Oh, sure. Because yeah. you're, you're absolutely absolutely right there. Um, and, and this is not uncommon when you see a, a company that has a traditional IT enterprise hardware looking to get into OT and, and rugged spaces, something we've been doing for over 20 years now. Um, but of course, you look at an increased thermals, you look at shock and vibration, you look at EMI. The one thing that I'll point out is um, Typically, our rugged hardware goes from minus 40 to plus 75 degrees Celsius. Most people in the industry go from minus 40 to about plus 60. Um, when, I first, when I first started here, I thought that was a typo. Um, it's not. Our devices actually go all the way up to plus 75. It's a side effect of making the hardware ourselves, of making the ASICs, designing them ourselves, so we know everything that goes into the hardware. We can certify it up at those, at those higher levels. Is that running or just boot? That's running. That's running. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's more of a concern. At the, at the lower end for booting. Um, once they're started up, they're, they're self-heating. Um, but that is plus 75 ambient still air. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cool. Yeah, it, I thought it was wrong first time I saw it. 
Um, and of course, since we've got all of that hardware, we've got our own custom ASICs doing all of the security enforcement, doing the IPS, doing the application visibility, we can see in real time everything that's going through the network, everything that's going through. We can identify assets. We can tell you what you have uh, in your OT environment. We can discover uh, some of those PLCs, some of those devices that are, have been out there for 10 years that you forgot about. Um, so we can identify those. And because we are doing deep packet inspection on all of the traffic going through uh, the FortiGate, we can identify what vendor it is. We can identify what software they're running. We can identify the vulnerabilities. Um, so we can provide all of that views inside of our uh, traditional asset identity list, but we can also provide what's called a Purdue model. Uh, and if those of you that you know, haven't worked in OT before, just tune out for 30 seconds. The Purdue model is basically developed by Purdue University. It's a, it's a five layer hierarchy of, of OT environments where you start at the very level, lowest level, at level zero at operational safety uh, cutouts, and you move up from there up to level five where you're at the IT DMZ and, and those types of things. So we can provide uh, a Purdue model view of all of the assets that we discover, providing something that's very friendly and familiar to an OT professional. Same data going in there, we just provide it in a slightly different view. All this is available, like, even with, this, this does not require a full stack FortiNet solution? Like, it could be- No, like no this, is, this is just a well, FortiNet. As long as the, we, we get the mm -hmm. OT, I guess, description or- So you license. can, I believe you can do the OT view even by default. The OT security service um, gives you an update. Uh, gives you some of this. Uh, so these are the application yep. signatures yeah. I'm telling you about. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so <laughs> the OT security service gives you around 3,000 additional application specific uh, views and controls. Um, and this is a little bit of an eye chart, but you guys can look at this a little bit later. And this is all available on fortiguard.com if you're ever curious. Uh, you can dig into all of these. Uh, all of these and more are different OT protocols that we understand. Some of these with a single arrow here, we can drill into and not just understand Profinet, but we can understand uh, Profisafe and we can understand Profinet reads and we can understand Modbus reads. Some of these with the three arrows, there's a few of them on here, um, are ones that we can actually enforce and actually read individual parameters within the protocol. So we can say that, okay, you're doing, and I'm doing this here, if we've got time, we can dig into it. I'm not just seeing Modbus yeah. uh, going back and forth here, but I'm also Actual looking at, values. I'm actually looking at the register that I'm reading and I'm enforcing it uh, to make sure that it's, it's appropriate. Um, so this is the OT Technology Security Service, OTSS, as we call it, uh, and that provides you an additional 3,100. It's growing all of the time. Uh, different application signatures, IPS rules, uh, virtual patch rules. This is out of date, I believe, um, you know, and the slide isn't that old. So it's constantly growing, constantly changing. Uh, so this is the only general, you know, additional value add stuff that we, we, we typically add. Uh, we've, everything we've been talking about today is included on the FortiGates kind of by default access point, Visibility, asset monitoring, IPS, those are all kind of there already. This is an additional charge just to add those additional signatures to the device. Um, device detection, I kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier. We can go through that. Um, and that allows you now that you've kind of discovered those devices and, um, let me go back for a slide. That allows you to determine vulnerabilities that you're seeing in your network. So we already are connected to the FortiGuard servers. We already get constant updates about new common vulnerabilities that we've discovered, that have been discovered in the environment. Uh, we can already pull that against the devices that we've discovered in the, in, in the OT environment. Uh, and we can then enable virtual patching, which is exactly what it sounds like. I think we kind of discovered, we discussed that a little bit earlier. So once we've discovered that you have a vulnerable device, we know what the CVE looks like, we know what the vulnerability, the exploit looks like, uh, we can just simply enable an IPS rule in the background to just automatically block that traffic. So if you've got a PLC that has a known vulnerability, there's a port scan or or something that, you know, on a specific traffic on a specific port that can affect that PLC, we can just go ahead and just enable an IPS rule. It's all happening in hardware, so it's not really something that has any significant performance hit on the device. You get to it, you patch it, you update it when you can. The network, the firewall is gonna protect that OT device from those exploits um, until you can get to it. So it can list, I mean, if I put this, let's say if I, it's a, it's a network, uh, you know, brand new deployment, I can kind of deploy this and it will, Show me all the devices. I can just pick one, and, and it will, I can just block it. For example, uh, well, well, you could you could do that, of course. Um, you, you could do that even without all of this. You could just you could you could quarantine a device. Uh, you can quarantine a device automatically uh, as triggers to other things that have been discovered in the network. But with this, you can actually discover a device. You can analyze it. Um, you can have it. I can show you if we've got time during the break. Uh, you can actually say that for virtual patching, I want to have all high priority and medium priority uh, vulnerabilities automatically patched. Can go ahead and do that for you. So 
Um, that's kind of where this comes into play. Okay. And then finally, the last thing I'll, I'll kind of close with here is partnering. I think, you know, Fortinet, I've, I've been around the block a few times, a few decades. Fortinet, I think, is partners with better than anyone else um, that I've seen. Um, they, they really do deeply, you know, get in and, and partner with solutions providers, technology providers, especially VARs. I can't tell you how well they partner with VARs. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's where they get into. That logo on the lower right looked good. Yeah, I, I noticed that one was there. <laughs> we should have molded that a little bit more, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so the, you guys, you, you all have always done a tremendous job with security and you, you've done a great job protecting every piece of the network that's plugged in there. But what, what I'm focused on the last couple of weeks, I've gone down the rabbit hole of over the air attacks and being able to control the airspace and identify not just from a WIDS WIPS, you know, mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. but from, from a general airspace perspective, understanding threats and attacks that are coming over the air. A printer yeah. that, that's a printer, but it shows up as a PC on your network because it's been mm -hmm. compromised. Do you all have any plans to start doing any type of over-the-air classification, over-the-air protection, uh, identifying you know rogue RF yeah. sources that are not yeah. just traditional wireless access points? But right, right. There's this whole twist where people are using those now to to do comp, you know, to, to gain access. To do, to do a software defined radio, to do a... a yeah, so, and, it's, and I would, yeah. you know, you all have always been a leader when it comes to the network security side mm -hmm. of it, right? So what about what about over the air stuff? Any, I mean, yeah. is that... I'm gonna let Sumant, I'm gonna let Sumant answer that because I, my, my, my answer, I've been here four months, my answer would be no, I don't believe we have any of that. <laughs> but so I'll let Sumant, you know, add anything if he has well, more to that. I, I will say that once it becomes you know, once it transitions from an over-the-air attack to a wired attack, we're phenomenal at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I understand what you're saying. If something that breaks the Wi-Fi 7 protocol and, and can do a denial-of-service attack on the RF spectrum, go ahead, Smart. Yeah, I think uh, we do, to a bit, support with WITS and WIPs, uh, but but over there, with the frequencies which we may, might not have control, like all these radios are specific to a band, right? It can be 2.4 or 5 or 6. Mm -hmm. On these bands, is something we have visibility, but non-wireless is also something we have visibility. Well, but non, that's non-Wi-Fi, right? So yeah. two gig, five gig, three and a half gig, yeah. six gig, something that comes up that the radio is subjected to, but you're not watching because you're just looking for traditional Wi-Fi devices. Is that something? No, so we're not looking at traditional Wi-Fi devices. Overall, we are scanning the entire spectrum for these. When there is already a signature for this particular device, mm -hmm. it can be detected and matched. But when there is no such signature which is already available, but you still detect something, but there is an intrusion or something happening from this particular device, then we can actually detect it through our existing uh, uh, products. That's the re one of the reasons where we have uh, dedicated a particular radio on our K-series, which is our Wi-Fi 7 series, which will only do scan. It'll, it'll be actively scanning. So earlier, prior to this, we had, we had models where you compromise on one radio, or use it as a background, like where it switches between service versus scan. Mm -hmm. But now you have a dedicated radio with a two cross two scan going on doing the control packet and also some of the uh, data packets which we can scan and dissect to see what's happening. What it actually yeah. is, okay. Yeah. 